Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to church this morning. Happy Sunday morning to you. It is March 29th, 2020. And as you can see, we're still not able to meet together in the church building. But we are still the church. Um, so in saying that, we are going to continue all the things that we can. Uh, and especially the important things, such as our discipleship, our ministry, and our outreach. Um, now, there's several ways I wanted to, as in way of announcement, there are several ways that, that we are continuing the teaching and discipleship ministry. Uh, first, for adults, um, Brother Jack is continuing to have adult Sunday school, but he is actually doing that by telephone or computer. Uh, you can find out how to log into that or to get into that by calling him or calling me or calling Larry, and we can give you that information. It, it can be as simple as just dialing a number on the phone and then putting in a code that we give you. And then you can hear us talking about God's Word. Other things that adults have access to is, of course, our Sunday morning services for everyone, as well as other videos that are put out on questions that have been received um, or even maybe announcement videos for the church. So be looking for those kind of things to come. Uh, now, for our teenagers, we are also putting out a Sunday school uh, video as well as a midweek discipleship video. Uh, for sort of our youth group. So be looking for those. And for children, we have Sunday School and Awana um, teachings going on on video. I'll tell you at the end how to find all those kind of things. Um, in way of other announcements, um, one thing that there's been questioned is what do we do with our tithes and our offerings during this time since we can't meet in the building and pass the offering plate? Well, you know that our offering money goes to many different ministries. Um, we, uh, one thing is the building, we uh, maintain it, we keep the lights on, the trash, the water, all of those things uh, that are needed to go. Uh, it also pays your pastor's salary so that I can continue to minister while taking care of my family. Uh, it supports many missionaries around the world through our cooperative program and, um, and other ministries that we support. So our tithe is important. And of course, beyond that, offerings that are given to the church. If you would like to give during this time, you can give me a call and we can figure out a way to do that. Or you can uh, give Darla a call or you can just send it in my mail to the church or drop it off by the church and I'll kind of stay separate from you and meet you somewhere. However you want to do that, that would be a great blessing to the church. Um, now, just in way of thinking, when we come together... Uh, we may need to take some opportunity to pray and see if God would lead us to give so that our ministry can continue and we can rebuild some funding that we'll lose during this time. Um, but that'll be completely between you and God, and we'll trust God to take care of us until then. All right, so let's move on here. Um, oh, I guess one of the other things that I need to let you know is how to find these videos, uh, how to get, get linked to our church services and our discipleship. Well, there's several ways. Uh, every video that goes out is placed both on my Facebook page and the church Facebook page by way of link. And so you can look at those things, click on those things. Uh, my Facebook page is just under Mike Clements. Um, the church's Facebook page, you look up Trinity Baptist Church of Binkelman Facebook, and you can get to it that way. Uh, or you can go to the source, which is YouTube, and there are three channels there that you can look at. Uh, the first is just under Mike Clements, and this is where we have uh, many of our videos for the church in general. That's our Sunday morning videos, question videos that we have, maybe announcement videos, things like that. Uh, secondly, I also have a channel for kids, and you can search, go on YouTube and search under YouTube for Pastor Mike's Kid Channel. And you can find their Sunday school videos as well as midweek Awana uh, teachings that are going to continue. Uh, thirdly, for teenagers, we also have Pastor Mike's Teen pay, uh, Channel, Pastor Mike's Teen Channel, that you can search that on YouTube. And in all three places, just look for my face. There's three different pictures, but you can look for my face. And, um, and that also on that Teen Channel has videos for Sunday School for Teenagers, as well as Midnight Midweek uh, Bible Study. All right. So may God bless you. May God bless us during this time dealing with this COVID-19. I've heard some good news this week, some good things happening. I think the Lord is blessing. The Lord is uh, even giving us um, blessings through our leadership, which is good to hear about. Um, but be in prayer for our leaders. Be in prayer for our missionaries around the world. 
uh, who don't have access like we do to, to medications and other things, and they're in places that um, this virus is going pretty rampant. Um, pray that people's hearts would be open to consider their future, uh, to consider uh, what the life is beyond this one. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning in our sermon. Um, but pray for them that God will use this uh, emergency, use this, even use this virus uh, to bring about something good and to bring a blessing to this world. And many will come to know him as Savior. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, if you need me, call me. If you have any announcements or anything you want me to put out, please just call me. And I'd love to pray with you and talk with you. Let's pray together. Lord God, today we thank you, Lord, for another great day. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together, even if it's in a very different way, Lord. God, help us not to forsake our discipleship, Lord. Help us to continue to grow and move towards you. Lord, help us not to forsake our ministry, Lord. Lord, we may not be able to go and see people personally in their homes, Lord, but dear God, help us to pick up the phone Lord, help us to reach out and to encourage, dear God, and to share the gospel with all that we can. Lord God, as we enter into a time of worship, Lord, open up our hearts, dear God, to, to sing praises to you, Lord. Lord, help us to realize that you are a God who is so worthy of our praise and our worship. Lord, bless us this day. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I know it's going to seem a little weird. It's not how we usually do that, but that's okay. It doesn't surprise God. We're going to worship our God because that's what he calls us to do. He talks about uh, King Saul being troubled. He had a troubling spirit. Things were not settled in his heart. So he called his wise men and his advisors together. He asked him what he could do to, to settle his heart. He was un, un, just unsure of things and, and he was worried. He was afraid. And they advised him to uh, call this young man who was a harp player to come in and play for him to soothe his heart. That young man was David, king, who had become King David. King David was one of the, the examples of a worship leader that we have in the Bible. God said he was a man after his own heart even. So David came in and played his heart and sang to Saul. So David was first a worship leader. He was a worshiper before he was king. And it calmed Saul's heart. And if you continue to read that story of 1 Samuel, that's what he, he did from then on. Whenever Saul was troubled, he, he had him come in and they sang. Music is a gift that God gave us to settle our hearts. So we want that to be a time like this. I know it's different, but it's also a sacrifice. I know it's going to be awkward. That's okay. But if it's not a sacrifice, it's not worship. So it's... I know you're in your living room and all that stuff. Maybe you don't sing. That's okay. God hears your heart, not your voice. So we're going to raise our voices up this morning and uh, just give him the worship that he deserves. It's for him anyway, not for us. So please join us as we worship this morning.
again. I hope you enjoyed that worship. I sure appreciate Scott Sarns and that worship team over at Parkview in Lexington. Uh, they are sure a blessing to us at this time. Now this morning we're going to jump right into the Word of God. Um, I said that, that we're going to be looking at some things related to end times because I'd, I'd had a question and I answered the question I think well on the video about is this COVID-19 bringing on the second coming of Christ and all of that. I think I answered it pretty well there. Um, but there's still questions about the whole end of creation. What exactly is, is going on before eternity begins, I guess, is the better question to ask. And this is what we want to look at this morning. But this morning, we're going to start off by a little quote I'm going to read to you. Now, this is from Billy Sunday. He was a, a pastor and theologian from um, the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. He said, the Lord does not come to the world at the time of the rapture but only reveals himself to the members of his body. At the time of his resurrection, he was only seen by those who believed on him. Pilate and the high priests and those who crucified him did not know that he was risen. So it will be at the, t at the time of rapture. The world will not know that he has been here and will have no knowledge of him until he comes with the members of his body at the close of the tribulation. Now, uh, you're saying, Brother Mike, are you going to be preaching on the rapture today? Yes, I am. But not only the rapture, but we want to take a look at the rapture as well as the second coming of Christ. You say, well, Brother Mike, aren't those the same thing? Actually, no. According to my scripture, I mean, my study of scripture, they are not the same thing. Now, there will be people that disagree with what I say on this video, and that's okay, because these things are not crucial to our salvation. We do know, first and foremost, that God loves us with a great love, so much so that he sent his one and only son. And if we just believe in him, if we just accept that offer, that free gift of salvation, that we can spend an eternity with him. And how that comes about is not as important as the fact that it will come about. But everything in God's word is important. And I want us to understand. So this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to jump right into scripture. Dear God, this morning I ask the blessing upon the reading of your word. Lord God, I ask that you open our hearts and our minds that we might understand. Teach us what is true. God, we love you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Now, what you see right here is what I believe to be an accurate uh, outline of what the end times will be. Well, it starts when Christ came nearly 2,000 years ago, and then we enter into what we call the church age. That's where we are now. The time that we are spreading the gospel, sharing with as many people as who will the, the gospel of Jesus and his love and salvation. Okay. Now, at the end of that church age, which is still yet to be determined at a time that only the Father knows, uh, I believe that there will be a time that the church is taken up. Um, just before we enter into a time of great tribulation, a seven-year period that the Bible talks about, a time of great trouble, uh, great testing, great judgments from God. Um, I do believe that there will be those that accept Christ during that time, um, but it will be much harder than it is right now. It will be a hard life, and there will, much will be asked of them if they do accept Christ. Uh, at the end of that seven-year, there's going to be 
uh, what is truly the second coming of Christ. You say, but Brother Mike, uh, Jesus came back at the rapture, right? Yes, but he never stepped foot on the earth. If you remember, the scriptures that we, what we look at related to that say that he calls us up to him. Um, so this, at this time, Jesus is going to step foot on the earth again, and we're going to find out why. But when he does step foot, he will stay here and he will rule and reign for a thousand years before a great war breaks out again. And then we enter into eternity. Uh, and what scripture tells us is a new heaven and a new earth and an eternity in fellowship with God himself on earth. Okay, so a little note there. The rapture and the second coming of Christ are two separate events. Today we're going to be looking at applicable scriptures related to that. All right. Okay, so let's move on to our scriptures again. Let me get out of the way. All right, Revelation 19, 11 through 16 is where we're going to start. And it says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepresses of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he has his robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, many of you know the book of Revelation. It is not all prophecy. It also speaks of things that, that were at that time. I believe that there are a few things that it's referring back to things in the past. But much of it is the future. And this is talking about future events. Okay? This is the second coming of Christ, as we talked about. The time where he will set foot on the earth. Uh, taking a look at some of this scripture, looking at those highlighted areas... And he who sat on him was called faithful, true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He is not coming this time to be the faithful servant, the humble servant. He is coming this, this, this time to take the world and to rule it. Who is? Well, that second one there, the Word of God. Who is the Word of God? John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was, God, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is Jesus we're talking about. Jesus will come back. He will make war. And he will rule for a thousand years. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. We'll find out that he'll rule for a thousand years, because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now jumping ahead just a little bit to Revelation 20, 1 through 3. We read, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. All right, this is our scripture. This is the second coming. This is what's going on in the end times. Now, there are several things that I want us to note, to note about this. And the reason I started here in the book of Revelation is because it's very clear. There's no question that these things will happen. It's spoken of in chapters 19, 20, and 21 plainly and in order. Uh, there's not a whole lot to interpret here. There are, there are things to interpret, but there are certain points that are just pretty obvious. And here they are. In Revelation 19, Jesus will be coming to take the earth in force. Again, not as a humble servant, but as a ruler. He will set foot on the earth to take it. Why is that important? We'll find out in a little while. But at this point, he is going to come to earth and he is going to live here with us and rule on this earth. Jumping to Revelation 20, we find out that Satan will be restrained and put into the pit. Jesus will rule on earth bodily for a thousand years and then Satan will be released and there will be war again. Even living under the rule of Christ, which is going to be just and wonderful, there are many that are still going to want their way. And they're going to side with Satan and they're going to come against him. But Jesus will overcome. Jumping down to 21, heaven and earth will be made new. Uh, it'll be cleansed by fire. No more sin, no more sorrow. It'll be like it was when God had created it and the way he intended it to be. 
Now the new Jerusalem, which is the city of God, it will actually come down and it will come to earth so that God will then dwell with us here on earth and he will dwell with man for eternity. What a glorious time this is going to be. But make note, there's no mention here that we're going to be taken up, but that he's going to be coming down. Okay, now we know the second coming will happen. After the great tribulation and after one man, which is Antichrist, takes power and, and rules the earth. But when does the rapture happen? You've heard of the rapture. When, when does it happen? Well, this is where we enter into some debate. Now, the word rapture itself is not found in Scripture. It's a term that theologians came up with um, because there were two things being described in Scripture. A time when Christ would take us up to be with him. Uh, and then also another time where he would come down in the end and, and rule and reign. So there were two different things, but the first was not actually named. It was used mostly to encourage uh, fellow believers uh, rather than to assign some name to it. All right. But because of that, because it's not 100% clear or, or directly stated in that way, there's some debate about when the rapture or even if the rapture will take place. Um, the three main ideas are pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. Uh, I believe in pre-tribulation. I believe that we will be taken up before the tribulation time starts. Mid-tribulation means some believe that we'll be taken in the middle of the tribulation time, some at the end uh, would be the post-tribulation. But the one thing I want you to understand in all of this is that how is not as important than as that he will take us that we will spend an eternity with him, all right? So don't get too caught up in, in all of this um, debate and argument and things like that. None of that matters. We'll know one day. The point is, let's be the church and be prepared for whatever comes, all right? Okay, now, but why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, all right? Now, our God has given us the scriptures to guide us in all things. You remember 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may completely be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You remember that? So God gave us his words so that we would know what it is that we are to do in this world. Okay, well, let's move on. So God has given us a scripture to guide us in all things. And Revelation has told us what was to be in the end times. We just read that. But God did not give us instructions on how to look for the Antichrist or how to resist him when he appears. This again, with the abrupt disappearance of the church's influence in the world in the opening chapters of Revelation, give us the idea that the church, which is his children, remember the church that in Matthew 16 it says that even the gates of hell will not prevail, prevail against it. This church, that this church has either given in or given up or is not pay, taking part in what's unfolding next, at least until the second coming, at least until the end of times. So this idea that uh, that we, the church is going to continue to be even through the time of tribulation, where are we? What are we doing? What are we? What are we supposed to do? Because nowhere do we see us in the book of Revelation after the first few chapters. All right. So there's the question I had. Now let's take a look at a few scriptures and and see if we notice, notice now differences from the Revelation account of the second coming, and then scriptures that we believe to be our, our scriptures related to um, the rapture. Okay? All right. Now, let me get out of the way again here. Now, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18 says this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an, of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with, him, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. How many of you were comforted with those words? How many of you are comforted in the fact that no matter what goes on in this world, that one day those clouds will roll back, Christ will call your name, and you will be with him through eternity. 
That's a great encouragement. But the thing is, is this is talking about this idea that we're being called up. That's very different than what we saw in the book of Revelation, right? Note down there at the bottom, Jesus at this time does not step back on earth. He has come to call us to himself in the clouds. No mention here of calling us up and then and then us coming back down in war or anything else like that. Um, now, a little note here, that, that Billy Sunday quote uh, that I had earlier, where he spoke of the resurrection only seen by his followers. Maybe, maybe not. It may be a, a secret thing that only we see, and all of a sudden, like in the movies, um, people will just be missing their co-workers and their family and, and others because they'll have been raptured. Whether that's exactly how it's going to be, we don't know. But we do know this, that when we who are alive and remain, we shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet him in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord through eternity. Be encouraged by that. That was the intention of this to begin with. All right, now, these scriptures here uh, give us another idea or some other thoughts about this rapture. John 14, 1 through 3 says this. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe God, believe also in me. Of course, this is Jesus speaking. He says, in my father's house are many mansions or rooms in some translations. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Note the difference here. The plan is for Jesus to take them to a place prepared for them. And, but at the second coming, earth will be man's dwelling place through eternity. So there is two different things going on. At one point, Jesus is taking us to be with him to his father's house. And in the other account, Jesus is coming to earth to then dwell and rule over us. Notice those two differences. But now this idea that Jesus is uh, going to take us up at our death, um, we get a good example of that when we look in Luke 23. You remember the thieves on the cross? There was one on his right and one on his left as Jesus hung there, uh, crucified for our sins. One of those thieves were... Uh, he was an evil man. He would he cussed and he ran and raved and he made fun of the Lord. But then the other here in verse 40, he says, but the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, speaking of Christ, has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that wonderful that we will be with him in paradise? When we die, if we die before his coming again, if we die or he comes again, one way or the other, he's going to take us up into the clouds and he's going to take us to his father's house where he has prepared many rooms. I know many of you love the idea of got a mansion up in the corner of glory somewhere. That's okay, but probably rooms are a better translation because it is the Father's house. It's a place that we can dwell with Him. Okay? So, be assured that Jesus will come. All right, let me get out of the way again. Now, I wanted to look at this particular scripture here, this 1 Corinthians 15, 50-52. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is wonderful that we're going to be changed. We're going to get new bodies. We're going to be free of this, the corruption that, that, that infests these bodies that, that has us growing older and growing sick. Now, Note that at the start of the thousand-year reign of Christ, mankind will continue as fleshly beings. It's different than here. This is saying at the time when he takes us here that we're going to be something different. We're going to be changed. But now at the thousand-year reigns, when Christ comes and he sets foot on earth, those that are alive and those that were even martyred previously during that time of tribulation for the faith, they are going to be alive again. And they are going to be with him during his rule. You can read about that in Revelation 24 through 6. Now, the church at the completion of that thousand-year reign 
will then be given their new bodies and they will dwell with God in the new heaven and the new earth through eternity. And you can read about that in Revelation uh, chapters 21 and 22 and that uh, 24 through 6 there all relate to the same thing. Um, so know this, we will receive new bodies and we will be with him. Whether we're taken up in the rapture or whether we're here to the end times and have gone through the tribulation one way or the other, we will spend time with him. Now, I've got a couple of scripture references there, and we'll take a look at those. In John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Philippians 3, 20 through 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be comforted, com conformed excuse me, to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Praise God that his promise to us is to make right what we made so wrong. We are the ones that brought sin. We are the ones that brought corruption in our own body, in our own world. But he is going to make it right. And one day we will be like him with a glorified body. Again, what he had originally intended from us from the beginning. Now, we also know that during the time of tribulation, look back at this time of tribulation, um, that God pours out his wrath on all the earth. All men are going to feel the sting, it says. But what does Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 5 and then also uh, John and Revelation 3. Now, I want you to understand in reading these things, I want you to understand that there are ways to interpret this differently. But my friends, in the context of what we've been talking about, and I believe in the context of Scripture, uh, I believe that this is very applicable to the idea, uh, are we going to be in this time of tribulation or are we not? First Thessalonians 5, 8-11 through 11 says this, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And whether we awake or we sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my commands to persevere. He's talking to one of the churches at the time. And he says, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, is he just promising to this one church, or is he talking about us? Is he talking about those who will be faithful? I believe he's talking to the faithful, those that have accepted him, that we will be spared that time of, of, of great trial, that hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. Again, this is why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. All right, now, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, I mean, really, does it all really matter? Does it matter? Well, to be honest with you, yes and no. All things God teaches us in his word matter. But there are some things that are more important than others. Now, what matters most right now is that you know him as Savior and you live as the church. Let me share with you one of the scriptures that I really like, uh, Titus 2, 11 through 14. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. My friends, we want to look forward to that time that he takes us home. We want to look forward to eternity when we can dwell and we can walk with him as Adam and Eve did in the garden. But my friends, until that time, we've got to be the church. These are the things I say are more important at this point. Yes, it's important for us to study. Yes, it's important for us to know what is to come because that gives us faith and a hope for the future. But right now, there are things to do. We live in what we call the church age. That's the term that theologians have put on it. The time that we must be out telling others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are Trinity Baptist Church. That's who we are. 
We're a representation of Christ in Binkelman and Dundee County in Nebraska and beyond. We have got to be the church. We can look forward and we can expect that great hope. But my friends, until that time comes, let's be the church. Let's be a, a special people, his own special people, zealous for good works, love, serve, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Going into Binkelman, going into Dundee County, Nebraska, and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is it important for us to understand the end times? Oh yeah, it definitely is. It's God's word. But my friends, right now, it's also very important that we simply be the church. God bless you. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice song.